Good evening. I'm David Cataforis, Professor and Chair of Art History at the University of Kansas. I would like to acknowledge that the University of Kansas resides on the ancestral territory of the Kaw people, who were forced off their land by the United States in the 19th century and largely relocated to Oklahoma. This acknowledgement recognizes Native Americans as traditional guardians of the land and the enduring relationship between Native peoples and their traditional territories. I'm pleased to welcome you to the fourth lecture in our series, Intersections of Identity, Expression, Exchange, and Hybridity. The series asks what constitutes identity, how do people navigate, form, and reform their sense of self, and how can the study of art and its history help us to consider the diverse identities expressed by visual culture and its creators. We seek to amplify the voices of scholars and artists whose work explores individual and collective identities as those intersect with notions of the body, disability, gender, heritage, and race. The series is organized by KU's Crest Foundation Department of Art History and our History of Art Graduate Students Diversity, Equity, Accessibility, and Inclusion Committee. It is sponsored by the Franklin Murphy Lecture Fund. We present it in partnership with the Spencer Museum of Art, KU Department of Visual Art, Lawrence Art Center, Lawrence Public Library, Raven Bookstore, Black Lawrence, and other community partners. The graduate students and I want to thank Art History Department Office Manager Lisa Clore for all of her organizational help and acknowledge the creator of the poster for this evening's lecture, KU student Aaron Begay. It's my privilege to introduce our speaker, Kimberly Jenkins, who is Assistant Professor of Fashion Studies in the School of Fashion at Ryerson University in Toronto. She previously lectured at Pratt Institute and Parsons School of Design, from which she holds an MA in Fashion Studies. Professor Jenkins is an educator specializing in fashion history and theory, and also a lecturer, researcher, and consultant who investigates the socio-cultural and historical influences informing what we wear and why we wear it. She's best known for creating the course and exhibition entitled Fashion and Race at Parsons, and for working as an educational consultant for Gucci to support their cultural inclusion and diversity efforts. In 2017, Professor Jenkins developed an institutionally funded online research project called the Fashion and Race Database, which she'll speak about this evening. And the next year she curated her first exhibition, Fashion and Race, Deconstructing Ideas, Reconstructing Identities. The database relaunched in 2020 with substantial funding from Ryerson University and her Fashion and Race exhibition returned that year in virtual form on the Google Arts and Culture platform. Professor Jenkins has presented lectures and participated in panel discussions at the New School, the Fashion Institute of Technology, Queens University, Seton Hall University, Columbia University, Columbia College, the Booker Museum of Art, the 2018 TFAF Art Fair, South by Southwest, and Google HQ, among others. She also facilitates a traveling series called the Fashion and Justice Workshop with her collaborator, Dr. Jonathan M. Square of Harvard. Numerous websites and publications have called upon her expertise, including Vogue Business, The Business of Fashion, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and W Magazine. Her work as an educator has been profiled by Vogue, The Guardian, Dazed, ID, The Washington Post, Nylon, The Saturday Paper, Refinery29, Fashionista, CR, Grazia, and The Root, among others. Her academic research and writing has appeared in Foam, QED, a journal in GLBTQ Worldmaking, International Journal of Fashion Studies, the Fashion Studies Journal, Art Jewelry Forum, and her advisory work has supported exhibitions at the New Orleans Museum of Art and the Central Museum. Professor Jenkins will entertain questions after her lecture this evening, so please type your questions in the chat on YouTube, and members of the HAG's DEAI committee will moderate the Q&A. I'm happy now to turn the screen over to Professor Jenkins, who will speak on the fashion and race database, providing a pedagogical platform amidst fashion's racial reckoning. And I just need a sharing capability.
Okay. Okay, can we see the screen clearly? Yes, thank you. Perfect. Okay, hopefully it's large enough. Um, and I'll have uh, some text in here also that I'm sharing. I have a lot to tell you tonight, a lot to share. Um, first of all, thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here uh, this evening and share my story. Um, it, 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 thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm excited to join, join you and just enter, again, entertain any questions you may have. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I just wanna start the talk here with uh, an image that was recently commissioned for my project, the Fashion and Race Database Platform um, by Barbara Estriel, uh, who is an artist out of Mexico City. Um, she goes under the name Museo de Moda. Uh, we found her on Instagram and she's known for her collages and she made this piece, especially for the Fashion and Race Database to kind of tell the story of uh, these key components that I wanted to touch on uh, when it comes to fashion and race. So um, as you're seeing at the top, kind of the tag of a Balenciaga, famous designer in fashion history, Cristobal Balenciaga, um, shopping bags at the bottom, mounds of cotton, which were picked in the 18th, uh, 19th century um, to help build the textile and fashion industry um, as a result of slave labor, um, and old photographs also, uh, which speaks to um, my approach in trying to decentralize and expand fashion history by showing old photo albums um, from stories um, from people of color, uh, helping to share uh, our family members into the narrative of fashion history. Um, so just a little bit about me, my background. Um, I have a BA in cultural anthropology and art history, uh, an MA in fashion studies, uh, which at the time uh, was a new field. It, it still is kind of considered a nascent field. Uh, we were a little bit guinea, sort of guinea pigs. Uh, I was in the second cohort. So we were really the pioneering cohort for this program in terms of figuring out what kinds of careers there were. Uh, we found ourselves constantly explaining what fashion studies is. People were wondering, are you fashion history? Are you fashion design? Um, short answer is we're a little bit in the middle there. Um, but if anything, we are interdisciplinary. Um, when we're talking about fashion studies, first of all, and I really want to kind of clarify this before we begin, um, it is a new, newish uh, interdisciplinary field that um, kind of rests at the intersection of psychology, sociology, anthropology, art history, economics, politics, religion, uh, and as I will talk uh, to you tonight, race. Um, so fashion is this intermediary between self and society, as we tell it. Um, it expresses things and it also, um, when it comes to um, narratives that we uh, encounter in society, shapes how we present ourselves, how we dress ourselves and present ourselves in society. Um, so that is uh, my academic background. Uh, and I was influenced by Heike Jens, um, who I uh, supported as a program assistant uh, when I was, I was a very enthusiastic student in the program. So I was working under the, uh, the program, uh, the person who helped co-found the program, Heike Jens, um, a sociologist and as well as Christina Moon, again, the early cohort of professors in the fashion studies program, sort of trying to make a name for this um, department. Um, and then also I greatly admire Sarah Lewis. And so you'll see her kind of seep into my work, a uh, professor at Harvard University, known for her work on um, vision and justice, a course that she created. Um, and I'll just uh, speak a bit about her later. Um, also, and in terms of my engagement in the fashion industry, um, I'm a co-founding member of the Fashion Studies Alliance. So again, since we're this sort of nascent field, uh, my peers and I created an organization um, to help uh, create support for people in our field, looking for employment, sharing our research with each other. Um, so things like that. I'm also uh, more recently, as of last summer, amidst the race, racial reckoning, I'm an executive board member um, of education for the Black and Fashion Council, which was founded by Lindsay Peoples Wagner, the now former editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue, now at New York, New York's The Cut magazine, and Sandrine Charles, uh, who has her own PR firm. So I sit proudly with them. Uh, and I'm also on the board of directors for the International Library of Fashion Research. 
Um, and of course, I'm the founder and director of the Fashion and Race Database. So um, I want to start off by um, speaking about how I started carving out a space for myself in fashion and race uh, after maybe two years of graduating. So I graduated in 2013 with an MA in fashion studies, and I was lucky enough to get um, a position teaching both at Parsons School of Design, my alma mater, and Pratt Institute. And the classes that I started out with was fashion history and fashion theory. And at the time, those were just the two things that I, I was teaching uh, along with research methods and a class called uh, New York Fashion. Um, once I kind of got my feet wet in teaching, um, I decided to pitch a course in 2015 um, within the department of um, ADHD, Art, Design, History, and Theory at Parsons School of Design called Fashion and Race. Um, there was a little bit of concern. I'll be very open with you in this conversation tonight. There was some concern when I was pitching a class called Fashion and Race. Um, thoughts that, you know, maybe, maybe not fashion and race, you know, maybe that's a little, a little too in your face, a little too bold. Um, but I really wanted to um, stick with the title. I knew that it would be something that the students could ide easily identify. Also during this time, um, there was some, uh, racial and social unrest already happening at this time um, between Trayvon Martin um, and, and Michael Brown in the year uh, to come, uh, Black Lives Matter movement happening around this time. Um, so these tensions were bubbling up and I knew this would be the right time to pitch a course like um, Fashion and Race. And so when it ran, uh, it was the fall of 2016 and um, it was waitlisted. Uh, students uh, thought, you know, that this is the class we've been waiting for. This is a safe space for us to speak and think through these things, all of these things that we've seen around us that we can identify. Finally, there is a class um, to uh, vent these frustrations and really get under the hood of what's happening in society and in the fashion industry uh, and just the creative industry in general. Students were um, frustrated with uh, cultural appropriation, which was a buzzy term during that time, just as much as it is now. Um, and um, students were just looking for a place to have these conversations and were curious, what, what is a fashion and race course? Um, so by a year after that, 2016, um, I collaborated on an academic website project with a peer uh, of mine, Ricky Bird. She graduated a couple of years after me within the fashion studies program. Um, so we started off with a WordPress blog called the Fashion and Race Syllabus. Um, and in that year, I went on to do public speaking. I was uh, very much a public friendly academic. I wanted to get, uh, my approach as an academic was, I wanna get the word out about the work I do, not just about fashion and race, but in these conversations that we have inside of the classroom about why we wear what we wear. So um, I was doing panel discussions and talking with the media um, about all of these things whenever they wanted to uh, have conversations about that. Um, and so by 2017, I decided to strike out on my own um, fashion and race wise and launch the fashion and race database project. Um, so the fashion and race database project was something I was sort of working working on in 2016 and formally um, launched it in 2017. I'm using another popular branded website. Um, and where that came from was between 2015 and 2016, when I launched the Fashion and Race course, um, I was struggling to find sources, um, it, sort of an organized list or a dedicated space of resources on this sort of idea of fashion and race. I knew that the materials were there, but they were in art history, they were in critical race theory, they were in cultural studies, they were in Africa, Africana studies, um, gender studies. Uh, it was everywhere. And I was really struggling to put together the syllabus and I spent the entire summer, um, I knew what I wanted to talk about um, but finding the materials you weren't going to find in a fashion studies library. They just weren't really thinking um, 
in that way during that time. So I thought, well, you know, this is an opportunity to start building a kind of a rough framework for thinking through um, the intersection of fashion and race. Um, and by the way, when I'm using the word fashion, um, I use the word fashion as both a noun and a verb. Um, we often times in fashion studies like to think of fashion as a verb, fashioning the body, fashioning the self, fashioning your identity. So it is this practice, this ongoing practice. Um, it's reflexive and it's, um, it's also of course an object. It's something that you see on display in a museum. It's something you see on the runway. It's something you see in a magazine. So um, at the core of what we talk about in fashion studies, when we use the word fashion, we are thinking about it as both a phenomenon and an object to be studied. Um, so in terms of um, looking for sources for this fashion and race course, um, I was just kind of combing through all of these books and articles and uh, I finally settled on a uh, fashion and race syllabus uh, for the class. And um, I used the website that I started building called the Fashion and Race Database Project as sort of this repository, a place to showcase all of the sources that I found. I figured, why well, keep this to myself? I'm sure if I was having a hard time finding these resources, surely there is a student out there or another professor or researcher um, who could benefit from these. So when I started this website, I had a section called books and I just started displaying all of the books and links to the books on the site, articles, filmed lectures and panels by scholars talking about these things. Um, and I started getting emails all over the world in the, in the, years to, in the next couple of years that followed. Um, a student in Japan, a researcher in the UK, um, just saying, thank you, this really helped me through my thesis or my dissertation. Um, I was just looking all over the place in different libraries and here it all is consolidated uh, in one space. So I knew I was kind of onto something by that point. Um, this image I have here uh, at the left is um, the second year of me teaching the class fashion and race at Parsons School of Design at the new school. And this was an exercise. Again, this was something I was really kind of building this rocket as I was leaving the station, just kind of thinking about ways that um, I could get students thinking through fashion and race. So kind of creating these assignments, um, looking over at ways that people were creating these kind of visual or image analysis assignments in art history, um, or you know, just the, these other spaces and how can I adapt that for this fashion studies course? So this assignment was an exercise um, that we would do each year. I went on to teach this class for, uh, from 2016 through 2019. And it was this image analysis assignment where we'd go on this field trip to the university library at the new school. We had the privilege of having um, these bound archives of Vogue and Bazaar um, two magazines that uh, were launched at the end of the 19th century. So some poor person had to scan and bind every single one of these magazines since the end of the 19th century. Um, and the students would flip through it and I would challenge them to find an image and unpack it. How can we look, read into these image, uh, images when it comes to subject, um, the positioning of the subjects, um, what is the power dynamic when you're looking at the image? Is there any diversity in this image? Um, so we really had fun with that. And I would kind of, eventually I created a worksheet to kind of guide students through step-by-step um, -step looking through this um, image, looking through these images, and they would step-by-step -step have to kind of answer all these critical questions of what they're seeing here. Um, so uh, by 2017, I was ready to explore this further. Um, I was getting to know students in the classes um, who were taking, who are enrolled in fashion and race. And many of them were photographers, fashion design students. Uh, and so again, another great thing about the new school is not only did they have a democratic process of uh, allowing faculty members to pitch courses, which was the entire, um, that was entirely the uh, opportunity that I was given to pitch fashion and race, but they also had a process in our, um, our art galleries where you could pitch an exhibition that would run for about three weeks. And so I pitched an exhibition called, you name it, Fashion and Race, um, Deconstructing Ideas, Reconstructing Identities. And why I titled it that was thinking through how can we deconstruct with thinking about race as a social construct and its implications, 
how can we um, deconstruct um, the implications of race, what it has done to us, how it has labeled us, how it has categorized us. Um, how can you explode all of these narratives and these notions? And also in the aftermath of that, how can you reconstruct an identity for yourself that is um, nourishing and empowering and affirming? Um, so I had the idea in mind um, and I knew that I wanted to um, tap students at the school um, who were both in the, in the class uh, and students also who I just knew on campus who were doing brilliant work exploring ideas of fashion and race. And so um, that resulted in um, a few pieces that were from fashion design students where they were materializing these critical concepts of thinking about the racialized body um, through a dress or some sort of con conceptual experiment, wearable experiment. Um, this was uh, photography. I reached out to some, some photography students and um, we displayed that. Um, there were students who were doing um, printed work and illustrations, a student who did a fashion film on imprisonment and recidivism um, through her fashion collection, um, Joy Davis. Um, and so, uh, Joy Douglas, I'm sorry, Joy Douglas, who graduated with her BFA at fashion and she had a, a collection called Rebranded, which was addressing recidivism and her father had been imprisoned. And so, um, so it was a statement um, collection that she was doing on that. And it was well received. Um, over 200 people attended the re reception. The publication Refinery29 came out and covered it. ID, Dazed and Confused magazine all came out and covered it. Um, so it really kind of created a space and it had prime real estate. It was also showcased in a gallery that was at the street level at Parsons School of Design facing Fifth Avenue. So people were just stopping in their tracks. Um, I, I, I wanted this to really celebrate the work of students. So I had a former student from another class who was doing graphic design. And I said, I have an opportunity for you. Would you like to do the lettering, the vinyl lettering for the exhibition? So she um, did a mock-up and then another student who had taken fashion and race worked in the print studio and they made the vinyl lettering and you just saw it in huge letters, fashion and race, deconstructing ideas, reconstructing identities across the glass and people just kind of stopping and looking and then looking in at these dresses uh, and just all these beautiful pieces and um, eye-catching photography for this. So a year, um, the year that I had um, uh, the fashion and race uh, exhibition was 2018, it was in the fall. It ran uh, late October through November of 2018. Um, that year in 2018, I accepted the award um, Outstanding Achievement in Diversity and Social Justice Teaching at the New School, um, where the New School had um, applauded the work I was doing on fashion and race at that point. Um, so by this point, I decided that I, um, I already had this in mind, but I had wanted to build what I called a suite of pedagogy. So um, back in 2015 and into 2016, when I was thinking through this course that I would pitch, um, I thought it would be so nice to kind of have this um, suite, like these three pieces of um, ways to engage with fashion and race. So one piece could be a course. Um, that you could enroll in, the fashion and race course. And then I thought another piece of this puzzle could be uh, an exhibition, done. You know, so I had the first two now by 2018, done. Um, and so then I thought a third piece could be this online library or repository of project. And so that was the fashion and race database project, which I then started flushing out further. And so then I had solidified this suite of pedagogy that, you know, um, you could enroll in the course, course, if you were not attending the new school, you could just use the Fashion and Race Database website as a way to engage with the material. It was more public facing, as well as the exhibition, which was this kind of immersive way, uh, as you can see here in this image, um, this gorgeous um, oxblood piece um, dress that um, was um, um, mounted by student LaShawn Coster. Um, it was quite an adventure for me to run across town back and forth to DHL to get the headpiece that you see hovering above the dress. She was working with a 3D 
design studio in Italy to make this horned headpiece. And um, as she was thinking through racialized bodies and comparisons to these kind of grotesque or beastly like figures, and then playing off of that and making it this exquisite, you see this kind of Charles James-esque gown here in front of you. And then this kind of Alexander McQueen dramatic effect where you have um, this horned headpiece um, hovering above. Um, it almost did not make it. And I made it in, I think the day after the reception, unfortunately, um, it was kind of caught in customs. Um, and I was able to get it. And then we had it um, suspended from the ceiling for just a whole dramatic effect there. Um, the piece that you see in the very back also was speaking to the racialized body comparisons to primates where student Carly Haywood um, uh, did this piece that is, um, it's a little difficult probably for you to see, but there, there are these chaps, these pants that are made from this kind of furry material, almost like a gorilla. And then she made this bomber jacket out of lace fronts, which are these wefts of hair often worn by black women uh, for wigs and weaves. And so she made this whole um, bomber jacket out of that. Um, so it was very provo provocative to say the least. Um, so at this point, I'm, I'm really kind of um, solidifying this social justice oriented approach to art history, um, uh, to fashion history, but I was looking to social justice oriented approaches in art history to better inform the work I was doing and enter um, Dr. Sarah Lewis, who I've had the pleasure of knowing and meeting. Um, she had a class at Harvard um, called Fashion, the Vision and Justice. And then uh, she collaborated with Aperture Magazine to um, have to publish a, a special series um, that she edited called Vision and Justice. Um, it was actually, it, it turned out to become uh, one of the top selling issues that they've had, um, the work that she did. And she had various covers too. I have one actually hanging above me as we speak, um, hanging above my desk um, of Dr. Martin Luther King. It's, it's a photograph of Dr. Martin Luther King, his father and his son, as they're kind of in this triangular image looking at you um, straight ahead. Um, it's beautiful. So she talks about the intersections of image making and the early technology of photography as this way to implore citizenship and belonging. And so one case that she speaks about in her civics courses that she does outside of, part, um, out of Harvard is Frederick Douglass, the most photographed man in the 19th century. So I find her work um, incredibly powerful and I started kind of modeling some of my work after her. Um, so, um, so, so after this was kind of established, I also a couple of years in now started establishing exercises um, that I found kind of popular or well received um, by students and through my traveling workshop with Dr. Jonathan Square about fashion and justice. And um, it would be Im image analyses where we would throw an image up on a screen um, in fashion. And in our workshops, I mean, we went from Chicago to Austin to New York, um, and we would have the whole audience, any, you know, anyone could enroll. It, it was um, long-term learners, teenagers, everyone would enroll in these workshops that we would do. And we would all together unpack these images, just like I was doing uh, with the students in the library of um, thinking about power dynamics and what we think of these kind of fashion images. What do they tell us? Um, another popular exercise that I started doing in the classroom, actually in my fashion history class, um, was our fashion history, I call it. Um, so again, I, I was teaching at Parsons and Pratt Institute this whole time, um, since 2013 is when I started teaching. And um, as a woman of color, as a black woman, um, oftentimes there would be semesters where I was the only black person in the room. Um, teaching these classes because I was teaching more than fashion and race. I was teaching New York fashion, advanced research methods. And um, in teaching fashion history, um, it, I mean, it, it's interesting, you know, I had to learn all of the history, all of the European history. I needed to know all the designers. I needed to be well-versed in talking about Yves Saint Laurent all day and his idiosyncrasies you know, and just all of the designers inside the canon of fashion history. And I can do it. And I talk about this with the students, but also um, I had to do this double work.
that I wasn't always seeing happen in the field. And that was even back then, I started teaching fashion history in 2014, um, finding little ways to decentralize these histories, diversify these fashion histories. So I figured out a fun assignment. I challenged students, this was not uh, mandatory. I invited students to send me family photos that um, to share uh, prior to the week, um, the era that I would be talking about in the next week. So if I'm talking about the 1940s, I would tell you this week, send me some family photos um, of, your, of your relatives uh, in the 1940s so that I can share that after my lecture. And the students really enjoyed it, especially my racialized students, because it was this way for me to kind of teach this canonized fashion history. But then afterwards, it was this opportunity to really, I, I wouldn't say dismantle it, but just expand the narrative. You know, it was an opportunity for my Vietnamese, Chinese, Cuban, these students to kind of um, bring their grandmothers or their grandfathers image into this narrative. And um, that is why I call it our fashion history because it is our fashion history. Um, I, I wasn't really interested in just kind of shoving this canon at them or these designers we have to deify and that that's all that matters. You know, we all fit in the frame of this picture. Um, and then um, also cultural appropriation workshops. Um, I would put on um, some workshops um, through worksheets where we would kind of explore, is this cultural appropriation or not? All guided by uh, Susan Scafidi's three S's. Susan Scafidi um, established the Fashion Law Institute at Fordham University and has done groundbreaking work on building this new um, area, this new career area of fashion law trademarking, trademark infringement, cultural appropriation, things like that, um, litigating major issues that are happening in the fashion industry. And she came up with the three S's, which is source, significance, and similarity. These are kind of the three sources I encourage students uh, and designers and executives to keep in their back pocket whenever they are thinking about uh, something that is alluring to them, but does not come from their own lived experience. Um, of their own personal history, or it is outside of their culture. Do you know the source of it? Can you identify the significance, whether it's social or um, sacred? And um, similarity, if you were to copy it, would that be disrespectful? Um, or, you know, if you were to change it in any sort of way, would that be considered disrespectful? So, um, so I start kind of coming up with these frameworks and, and these kind of, um, quick and easy ways to um, educate these new audiences. So speaking of new audiences, um, I hit a milestone. By 2019, I have been teaching, um, by, by the beginning of 2019, I've been teaching fashion and race for a couple of years. I had won an award at the new school for the work I was doing on this. And there was more chatter about, you know, the, this work on fashion and race and um, what students were saying. So. Um, what happens at the beginning of 2019 is we have a luxury brand um, by February of 2019 that is grappling with a um, PR crisis, um, and that's Gucci. Gucci was being accused of racism and just outright tone deafness of having a black sweater, this balaclava sweater that had these large red lips. When you pull this kind of turtleneck sweater over your mouth, um, First of all, I just wanna say, the sweater was made in various colors, like white, yellow, purple, and all of them had the red lips. But the misstep was in the design team, okay, not a big deal if you're pulling up a purple sweater with red lips around your mouth or yellow or white. But when you do black, it immediately triggers um, this iconography of blackface um, or gollywogs. And so, um, all of a sudden it was splashed all over the newspapers, Gucci's making blackface sweaters. Um, so it had caught on like wildfire in the social media. And it just so happened that Gucci had come to visit uh, the new school that week. And um, the new school had invited me to join a conversation with them on stage. And um, I got to know the team and they invited me to days later uh, fly out to Italy to their headquarters and talk education with them. And um, that started the beginning of a 
short-term relationship that year where uh, Marco Bizzari, um, who's pictured here in the middle, um, Marco Bizzari is the CEO and president of Gucci. And then over to the far left is Alessandro Michele, who is the designer, the visionary behind Gucci. And um, it just so happens they're very sort of academic friendly. They enjoy working with professors from different fields and, and disciplines. So um, they, uh, Marco had these ideas of, you know, we need to, we need a lesson, Let, you know, let's do this. And so um, I worked with them flying to Milan a couple of times, flying to Hong Kong to their Asia market, um, teaching about these things and kind of doing these sort of bite-sized lessons of fashion and race. Um, but also during this time, um, I'm getting exhausted. Um, I felt like I was really kind of, I thought I was doing kind of impactful work. Um, but at the time, admittedly, I was a contingent laborer. I was a part-time faculty member at Parsons School of Design. And I felt between 2018 and 2019, I really felt that the industry needed some education. Um, it, they really needed that preventative measure of having a professor come in and um, just kind of lay the groundwork for things that, you know, when it comes to design thinking um, or inspiration, having an educator come in there and almost sort of quote unquote proofread their design decisions before it goes off um, to marketing and production, uh, production and marketing. And so um, it fell on deaf ears. I mean, I was talking to um, a friend of mine who writes for the Wall Street Journal and he wholeheartedly agreed, um, but you just couldn't really get, um, and this is perhaps just also just the way the fashion industry works. You just can't really get them to invest money in preventative measures like that Oftentimes it is easier, oddly enough, to just let a crisis happen. You put some money towards it, extinguish the fire and move on. And there is no structural change. And I have a big problem with that. Um, so you just end up with all these very kind of superficial performative measures that are done, funded by marketing budgets. And they hope that you'll forget it. Now you're on to the next crisis. You're thinking about something else. You're distracted on social media and you've forgotten what they've done. So um, this continues to go on um, until 2020. And um, I, you know, I'm also during uh, these two years, I'm inviting people to come speak and I'm not getting full responses from people. It just didn't seem, everyone loved this kind of sexy idea of teaching fashion race, but um, people just weren't, they just didn't think it was that urgent. Um, some people didn't. So um, especially the industry. So I was thinking, you know, they could really use educators at a time like this. Um, and so 2019, I'm working with Gucci. And then I also get a phone call from a lawyer, a woman of color who practices law. And she becomes offended that year by Prada. Um, Prada makes a racist misstep. And so this does not go down as easy as Gucci. Um, this is a lawyer who gets upset by this. And she does not let it go. Um, she gives me a phone call. We speak for over an hour and um, she goes on to work with the Human Rights in Institute or the Human Rights Council in New York City and they take Prada to task. And, not a, and when I say take them to task, they put on a full on lawsuit and, and really kind of set these parameters for what Prada needs to do. Um, they need to have a DNI officer. They need to do this sort of training and for the next three years. I mean, you can look it up online. I don't want to kind of butcher the uh, the press release that came out, but it was groundbreaking. This was the first time that we saw a fashion brand really get litigated for offending someone. Now, you know, I feel like this is a whole separate conversation for us to have, but I think it's interesting, and and I'd like for you to reflect and think, you know from um, in terms of art or fashion, how do you feel about um, the possibility that someone can sue you because they are offended by what you have designed culturally? Um, and, and, you know, something like this leaves very little room for discussion. You know, it could be, well, I had no idea about that or I, I didn't know. We have a lot of fashion brands saying that and it's just not working. It's just not cutting it. Um, Many people are saying, oh, come on, you're a globalized brand, you're all over the place. How can you not know? 
what's offensive to us to the certain culture and you had to know that that was racist so i just it really so the issue with prada after gucci really sets a precedent in terms of what now can be done to fashion brands um, if they design the wrong kind of thing so um, i move on with the fashion and race database at that point and um i in the summer it was a very busy 2019 after well actually concurrent with working with gucci i am offered a full-time position um, out of my part-time situation and that is at ryerson university in toronto and uh, they felt that the work that i was doing um, was worthy of a tenure track position so i i move um at the end of 2019 and begin work at effective january 1st 2020 uh, in toronto canada I'm American, so this it's a whole new experience for me. And that is where I still am right now in Toronto. And so um, with that came the opportunity for research funding. You know, there's just more opportunities being on the tenure track. So um, after I finish my first semester, the very first thing I think of is, well, well, you know, for starters, I'd love to make this um, database more robust. Um, it was just sort of this kind of flat website um, that I was running by myself and depending on how busy I was, I was just kind of letting, you know, dust was starting to collect on it. So um, with the funding, some just, it was a small bit of funding from um, Ryerson, but it was significant enough for me to hire a web developer. I start looking online for web developers um, who specialize in digital humanities projects. And I look around online and I find this um, really brilliant digital humanities project that maps lynchings that had happened through the South and through California. And I saw that this company called Out Studios, A-U-U-T Studios by R.J. Ramey was behind all of this. So I just kind of cold emailed him and I just said, I love your work. Um, is there anything you can do for me? And of course he knows nothing about fashion and he was just thinking, oh, okay, what do you have in mind? And so, um, I explained the vision for the fashion race database. He sees the existing website. Um, and I just tell him, I want this to be a robust platform, a destination for research and resources and essays and just new ways of publishing that's very immersive. And um, I just really want to give people an experience. Um, and he does that. You know, we go back and forth. This is April and through May of 2020. And we're going through design ideas and looking at websites we like. And um, finally, by June, um, you know, he just knocks it out the park. It, I'm really pleased with it. And um, again, mind me just thinking of the timeline here. This is April when I begin this conversation with him and in May. And we planned on having early July as the launch date. And so um, this image, this very provocative image that you're seeing here to the right is the artwork of Fabiola Jean-Louis, who graciously let me borrow this image of her artwork. She makes these actually human-sized large paper dresses that hark back to the 17th and 18th century. She, she poses this intervention in these kind of classic, quote unquote, European dresses. And this intervention she poses is by, you can kind of see here, there's newspaper print. She has, um, this sort of disruptive or disturbing material of um, what has happened um, to Black people. And you see here in the, what we would call the stomacher area of this dress, you see a man hanging. Um, and that's why this piece is called Rest in Peace. Um, and so uh, she, she deals with race in her artwork. And I thought, oh, this is, this is definitely um, the kind of complicated imagery that I want to really hit people with as soon as they come to the site. And, and to show what's possible, to imagine what is possible in terms of thinking through uh, fashion and race. So, um, so at this point, I have this sort of tagline that I've established, and that is here at the top of um, this slide here, the Fashion Race Database is an online platform filled with tools that expand the narrative of fashion history and challenge misrepresentation within the fashion system. I feel that that is disruptive enough, but generalized enough to make room for more ideas and collaborations and things that I'm gonna to want to do with this website. Um, and so for the sake of time, I'm gonna move on here um, from this text here. Um, 
So we launch July 8th, 2020. One thing we had never really bargained on, and of course no one bargained for, was the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery. And we see by, well, in May 25th, I believe when George Floyd died, um, this just creates a tidal wave for any and everyone who is doing work on race. And I was a prime target because here I am with a site, a website that has the word race in it. So people, it's like piranhas. People are just going after everyone who's doing work on race, decolonizing, social justice, activism, black anything, black history, black art, black design. Um, and so RJ, the web developer and I are just not prepared for um, just all of the attention that we start getting. So it was purely coincidental. Um, but as um, I launched this, here we have here on the uh, left is a picture of another student. Um, this was a student who was in the very first fashion and race class at Parsons in 2016. Her name is Rachel Cassandra Gibbons. And she did this, uh, this photo piece for the fashion and race data, uh, the fashion and race exhibition um, she made this just for it. It was gorgeous. It's also featured on the Google Arts and Culture website now where the uh, exhibition lives, as mentioned in my bio. Um, in 2020, uh, last year, um, Google Arts and Culture launched my exhibition to just live now um, at Google Arts and Culture. And they featured it also during International Museum Day in May of 2020, which was a great honor. Um, so. Um, so this is kind of a, 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 a screenshot of the website. I know you can all head over to fashionandrace.org if you want to see, if you haven't already seen what the website looks like, the finished product. Um, but um, we were just kind of thinking about, word, well, I was thinking about words he's designing. I'm thinking about and wrestling with these words like decentralizing and decolonizing. What words do I want to use? Um, and, and I wanted to be very delicate when we're using and kind of throwing around the word decolonizing and fully understanding how to use that and what it means. Um, why the word race is something I would get. Um, it, it's, you know, and um, for some European audiences, um, when I traveled there, um, race is not a word that is thrown around lightly. They prefer ethnicity, at least with the people I've spoken with there. Um, so it was very jarring. So um, as this website suddenly goes global and gets all of this attention during what we now know as this quote unquote racial reckoning that happens effective June 2020, um, you have people grappling with these words and, and there's these acronyms coming out like BIPOC, um, there's B-A-M-E in, in Europe or at least in the UK. Um, and again, people, not everyone loves the word race. Um, you know, who wants to use the word decolonizing, who, who should use it, who should not. Um, so language becomes a major issue. Um, what I'm also concerned about is um, kind of how can I articulate this bridge between academia and the public realm? Because now you've got a global audience that is listening to you and hearing what you have to say about fashion and race. What I also don't bargain for is, you know, I kind of get thrust into this spotlight with other people. And you have, you know, when it comes to conversations like this, there is a lot at stake for many people. I am not an Asian woman, but for Asian women, especially now with everything that's happened this week, there's people in the Asian community who got really excited about the Fashion Race database. And I felt that I had to quickly satisfy and speak to that audience and find the right resources, use the right language. Um, how can I do that? You know, how can I enlist um, fellow scholars or researchers to help do this work? And when it comes to sensitive topics like this, I had to watch myself also, the things I said or the things that we put on the social media for the Fashion Race database. You know, do we say Latinx or do we say Latin American? Um, you know, so there's just all of these nuances that I suddenly um, found myself getting into. Um, and um, so, so yeah, I think a lot of people also saw the website and began thinking this is a, an institute or it's a school. And it was just this website that I was building. And um, people, you know, I, we start getting um, interest of people wanting to work for the database, which is amazing. And I just wanted to 
hire all of these brilliant scholars who were writing with holding MAs and PhDs or were curators at different museums who wanted to work um, for the site. And um, I mean, we, we were just completely overwhelmed because we're realizing this had been sort of this new home that people knew they wanted or didn't know they wanted. So, um, so, so there was that, I guess it's kind of a good problem to have, but it was just very overwhelming and trying to satisfy everyone's racialized needs. Um, so I just wanna introduce you uh, quickly to the sections. If you're not already familiar with it, I wanna kind of spell it out. Um, also, when I was conceptualizing the database, the redesign of it last year, um, I wanted to have six distinct sections for people to navigate. Um, the first one is the library, um, the objects that matter, and these are kind of almost in, in terms of popularity, profiles, essays and opinion, the directory and the calendar. I'm going to go through um, a couple of these um, just for the sake of time. And um, just so you can kind of get an idea for um, the intentions behind it. The library is by far the most popular and widely used section. Um, I, I get emails from scholars, curators who say, we assign your database to our students to use whenever they're looking for something or, to, or if we're doing an exercise, if they're writing a paper. Um, so the library now, as of this week, we've amassed over 300 books on it, all complete with metadata. So keywords, tags, um, to help you navigate and find more books related to a certain subject matter like colorism, hijab, kimono, um, orientalism, um, black, uh, blackness and beauty standards. So, um, so we think through all of that. And so you'll just find an array of sources, books, scholarly articles, public facing articles, lectures and panels, podcast episodes, online exhibitions. Um, and then objects that matter is um, really a signature section. And I, this was a response to all of the um, cultural misappropriation that I was seeing in the public and in the, in the fashion industry. Um, the way objects that matter is set up is I kind of created this framework and template where the objects that you see uh, in objects that matter are frequently appropriated or referenced through fashion and art history. They are items that you may see worn in a disrespectful way at a Halloween party uh, or sauntering down a runway. What we do is we take that object and at the top of each entry, when you click in on the uh, object, you'll see um, the images, um, these contextual images that introduce you to the correct way, the original context, the correct way to wear it, the original people who created or designed this piece, um, how it's supposed to be worn. There was about a 500 word description that's sort of encyclopedic, just introducing you to the item. And then there's a sidebar with these kind of quick facts of what culture is it? What year, what time period did it come from? Um, what materials are used in its design? How is it constructed? Things like that. When you go scroll down to the bottom, the middle to the bottom, there's a section called appropriation and influence. And then you're gonna see these images um, where you'll see that object worn in a, a um, respectful way or, uh, you know, an example of a company like a fashion brand doing it wrong. Um, so, um, so that kind of is a teaching tool um, that is useful for students, scholars, and of course the fashion industry and just everyday people who are curious about these pieces. Um, so what happens with this racial reckoning? Um, with the racial reckoning, um, one thing that I had been doing since 2015, um, again, telling you that I was a, kind of a public facing academic, um, I was very friendly with the media and building relationships with editors and writers about what I was doing because I knew even back then, like six years ago, if people weren't listening to me, journalists were listening to me editors were listening to me. They were getting to know my work for designers who weren't taking me seriously or anyone else who I'd you know, invite to come sit in on the class or come speak to my students. I was strategically telling my story and kind of documenting it and letting them know the work I was doing. So by 2019 and by 2020, um, those same editors and writers and magazines, they all kind of got to know me and they reached out to me during this time. Um, one though, 
this was a first time, this was a milestone in itself, um, was Vanessa Friedman. Um, writer Robin Gavon of the Washington Post, she was getting to know my story. She saw me start working with Gucci and started documenting it. She wrote it, she wrote about it in the Washington Post. This is important because um, when it comes to a year later, talking about this racial reckoning and how did we get here and what mistakes were made or what could have been done better. Um, she was able to be my witness and kind of see the work that I was doing then and, and the solutions I was trying to provide. And here we are with this aftermath in 2020. So Robin Gavon goes on to reach out to me and we speak on um, Zoom for a while. And she uh, is putting together a piece called Fashion's Racial Reckoning for the Washington Post, which comes out at the end of August of 2020. And she just lays it all out and kind of notes the work that I had done and includes me in it. Ray Smith from the Wall Street Journal has been following my work. Connie Wang has been following my work at Refinery29 and she saw to it that Refinery29 documented the fashion and race exhibition. So making these friendships, these valuable friendships um, where they were acting as my advocates and writing about these things of, this is why we're here um, and connecting the dots or one of the reasons why we're here. Um, it, it really uh, was helpful with this work that I was doing. Um, and so Vanessa Friedman also reaches out and um, I had an opportunity to kind of weigh in about museums um, because as we saw in the racial reckoning, it was hitting everywhere from fashion, fashion companies to museums to fashion schools. I was featured in pretty much every article over the last couple of years about the looming crisis of racism in fashion schools, museums, uh, and in the fashion industry. And so, um, so Vanessa Friedman here, as you see at the screenshot to the left, um, she wrote a piece called The Incredible Whiteness of the Museum Collection. Um, and then that is when I start getting pulled in or invited into these opportunities to consult. <laughs> you have companies now in 2020 knocking on your door and saying, okay, we need help. We'd like to learn what you do. This education stuff you're talking about, we're ready to sit down and have these conversations. So since last summer, I have been adapting the classes that I have at school um, to fashion, um, uh, these fashion companies. So I've been working with a modeling agency, a popular modeling agency, um, a famous museum, in, in, a famous institution. Um, and I've now been speaking, you know, all the way up until this month to um, major fashion corporations um, who want to see what education can do for their company and what, you know, a fashion and race curriculum can do for their company. Um, in February, Women's Wear Daily announced um, my partnership with Tommy Hilfiger and PVH. And um, what was exciting about that, though, is that was more than just some sort of consulting job. Um, this was um, an opportunity to, actually, I've got it coming up here. I'll speak about it in a moment here. Just some more media here. Vogue, um, back when the Fashion Race Database launched in July, Vogue wrote about it. Here we go. And so then by um, this past month, um, there is the announcement that Tommy Hilfiger wanted to partner with um, a few celebrities and a couple of um, it, um, kind of these uh, companies or projects. And so one of them was the Fashion Race Database and another one was Harlem Fashion Row, um, who I, I know Brandis Daniel, the founder of Fa uh, Harlem's Fashion Row, and I'm so glad to see her really getting her due. So um, it was really exciting to be able to do this. And so that said, um, I've been able to kind of um, leverage that and this interest in doing this work with various companies. Um, since September of last year, in this racial reckoning, um, the Fashion Race Database has uh, raised over 80,000 in fundraising. Um, that was boosted by a celebrity campaign um, where we had, it was a famous comedian who was behind our uh, fundraising campaign. His wife, it was really his wife who was part of it, it was her idea. Um, she is a MA student um, uh, in costume studies and she's married to this comedian. And so he used his connections throughout Hollywood to get them all to kind of donate and support the database. And that gave us this crucial funding to hire a research team, hire these interns and pay them 
I was able to pay academic uh, writers, um, write, uh, black, indigenous people of color, able to, um, these guest contributors writing pieces for the database, I was able to pay them because so often, you know, we're just not able to compensate people who are doing academic work um, or academic adjacent work. So um, that provided numerous opportunities and really let us kind of have room to play and get to collaborate. And um, we also partnered with the Canadian luxury retailer Holt Renfrew in October. And once again, for Black History Month in February. Um, and so now we have a long-term partnership that we just signed uh, with Tommy Hilfiger. Um, so there's some exciting things on the horizon. Um, after that, uh, as of this year or last month, I decided to formally establish an education consultancy. It is called Artist Solomon. Um, and um, in setting up Artist Solomon, um, what I'm going to be doing is enlisting my scholarly friends, um, you know, whenever there's these problems in the industry, you know, come over, you know, I've got a great team of brilliant academic scholars who can help, you know, educate your team. And it does a couple of things. Not only is it educating the industry, but it really, it gives me this opportunity to celebrate all of my brilliant scholar friends who've been overworked or underpaid, undervalued, unseen in academia and have this new career pathway or this new kind of um, opportunity to um, Im impart their knowledge and their insight and make some impactful change in the fashion industry. Um, so, so that's kind of what we're doing. Um, but as I'm thinking about this company, which is named after my grandfather and my great, great grandfather, this is, Sol this is the Solomon of Artist Solomon, this image you see here. I did a piece for Foam Magazine um, over in Amsterdam um, a couple of years ago. And I shared this photo, which also is framed and sitting above me as we speak. Um, this is on my mother's side, my great, great grandfather. He's holding this book of knowledge. And um, I just thought it was really powerful as he's staring at you, staring into the lens of this camera. This is a photo from the 19th, late 19th century. Um, and so um, I was really inspired to use his name in my new company name. Um, but um, just thinking, what I'm thinking through right now is how do we price academic knowledge for the industry? I mean, I'm sure there's plenty of scholars who are already doing consulting work. So navigating that. Also thinking for my corner of the world here in the fashion system, is it a naive ambition? You know, is there gonna be a plateau? I've already started noting after the racial reckoning that happened last summer, um, I mean, the, I've had to have an assistant working with me because I get so many emails. And now my assistant and I were kind of laughing the other day. It, it, it's almost like crickets. It's just, you know, there was just all of this kind of urgency happening over the summer, still kind of urgent in the fall. And then it just sort of gets quiet. And then kind of the discourse or the things that were happening in the, the news, it all kind of changes. So um, I'm still having uh, companies reach out and which I'm pleased to see. Um, but it's just not the same level as it was last summer of people concerned about everything going on. Also granted, um, because I speak with a lot of these brands, companies, many of them quickly uh, implemented diversity and inclusion campaigns and, and they're doing the work now. So that is another reason why they're quiet is because they all did surveys or questionnaires and um, that generated reports by the end of last year. So now, they are having to do the work that the DNI officers are putting them up to. So um, they're kind of really spending the spring thinking through all of that and how are they going to restructure things and, and implement all of these changes for the long term. Um, but there's still this anxiety that the fashion industry is known for being fickle. You know, is this going to endure? Is this sustainable? Can you really change the fashion industry? Can you really um, ignite change um, and structural change within a brand? Um, can you reach the C-suite? You know, you, oftentimes the people I talk to are the people who I should not have to talk to. It's not, it's not the people of color who you need to toss my way inside of your company or the people at the mid-level who I'm aiming for are many of the white C-suite executives who are just saying, I'm going to let the DNI department work on this, or I'm going to have the people of color kind of manage this whole thing. They're good at that. They understand all of this and nothing changes because they are the visionaries. They are the heads talking 
Um, so those are the people I want to reach. They are the ones, um, this, this onus is on them to kind of also ignite this change. If they're not sitting in on the class or participating, what are we doing? So, so those are some of the things that I'm concerned about. Um, so kind of winding down here, um, just a, a few things of what has become possible with the Fashion and Race Database. Got a little image for you. Um, we have a section called the directory and Kai Marcel, our research assistant and I um, have just added this new section to the directory called educators and scholars. Um, when I say, can you see us now? Oftentimes I hear from whether it's colleagues or people in the industry, journalists, writers who are saying, I need an expert on X, Y, Z, who's black or Asian, where can I find them? Now go to the directory, click on educators and scholars, here they all are. Um, this helps um, writers and, and this is a service to students who are looking for mentors or people to follow the work of. And most of all, it is a way to salute and um, give a platform and stage to all of these brilliant scholars who have been doing the work. Before this became a thing, um, all of these scholars have been doing this work for years. So um, when you go over to that section, you can really kind of see everything they're doing. Um, of course, it brings the work of fashion studies now to the world stage. Um, between the work that I'm doing for the Fashion Race Database and for Artist Solomon, bringing these conversations to the stage, um, making it accessible for everyone to understand and enjoy. Um, also, it enables collaborations, not just with brands, but artists, writers, scholars, researchers, organizers, um, organizations. Um, working with my assistant, Erin, who is an MA Fashion Studies student, she's um, a little me now. She's, she was me back in 2011 to 2013. And she is getting a master class working with me right now because in the inbox, you know, she's writing a thesis about a lot of this stuff and diversity in fashion. And, you know, again, what a master class to manage my inbox and actually get to see what these people say or how they react, how some of them undervalue my work, saying things like, can't you put on a lecture for us for free and talk about race and explain this to us and help us out of this situation with our DNI team? Um, so she really gets to see all this and this will ultimately inform her work and her scholarship. Um, this also crack, um, lands a crack in suggesting new mon monetary values for academic work, um, opportunities for scholars to, especially during COVID now, ways to adapt your course modules um, for the industry. How can you kind of take your work to the virtual realm and um, support yourself? It also helps to liberate imposter syndrome that we're seeing with emerging scholars. They can come, you know, work at the database or work with artist Solomon and kind of think through this and work through this. Um, so, um, so kind of enough with, you know, the imposter syndrome. Um, and it gives them this opportunity to marry their scholarship with their passion in uh, just a really fun, co colorful way. So um, that concludes my talk here. Uh, if you are interested in following and supporting this work, you can find me at Kimberly M. Jenkins uh, on Instagram or follow the Fashion and Race Database at Instagram. Um, my website's KimberlyMJenkins.com. And we also, I author a newsletter every single week that takes you inside all of the things that I am producing and building still. You get to see a work in progress, new sections we're building, new things we're thinking through over at the Fashion and Race Database. So, um, that let that newsletter comes out usually every Tuesday. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Professor Jenkins, for that fascinating, really exciting talk. Um, and and we have a lot of great questions that have come in the chat on YouTube. And the audience is invited to continue um, typing questions. And uh, two of our history of our graduate students, Sarah Stepp and Vidita Reina will um, come on and read the questions to you. And, and we look forward to a uh, uh, discussion um, generated by, by the audience. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Professor Jenkins, again, for such a thought-provoking talk. We have some fantastic questions, like uh, Dr. Catforce just mentioned, from our YouTube audience. Um, the first question comes from Rachel. 
Um, she writes, thanks very much for sharing your experiences with us. Um, it seems like you've made a concerted effort to include students in meaningful ways that allowed them to express themselves. How do you think this inclusivity has shaped the way that your fashion and race projects have taken shape? Oh, in tremendous ways. Um, I mean, one thing was the fashion and race exhibition back in 2018 wouldn't have been anything that it was if it were not for student work. They carried that exhibition. They made it what it was. And they helped me explore what was possible. They designed things that I just never even thought of. Um, but then coming over to the Fashion Race Database by 2020 with the relaunch and redesign, <clears throat> we had two um, interns, our first cohort of research assistants, um, Safia Sheikh and Adriana Hill. They were Ryerson students. And they really, <laughs> they, they really explored this with me. I was explaining, I want this and I want, you know, we need to flesh out the objects that matter. And I was explaining what it could look like. And they wrote it. Yeah, Adriana just said, you know, what about this? And we kind of worked on it. Um, you know, it went from an idea that I had in my head and then, you know, she wrote it out and we're like, that set the blueprint. And we're like, yes, let's do more of that. And so she helped to both she, uh, Adriana and Safia really were fundamental in building out the fashion race database redesign, the library that you see, because with students um, and answering this question, um, coming from different lived experiences and cultures and ethnicities, they could speak on things that I could not. And one thing that I was keenly aware of in making the database a success, I didn't want it to be myopic or this thing just about my experience or my own culture. Um, I wanted them to talk about their experience. So Adriana Hill was responsible for a lot of the content that you see in the library when it comes to indigenous clothing and dress and Asian um, Asian diasporic dress. Safiya Sheikh, she was focusing on the Muslim experience, Arabic dress, um, Palestinian um, dress. I mean, she, they just really um, added so much to it. And so now we have a new research cohort, uh, Laura Beltran Rubio, who's a PhD student at the College of William and Mary. Um, and she is just really, she's just expanded our entire collection um, from objects that matter to the library with Latin American fashion history. And then Kai Marcel, who's black um, and coming from Sarah Lawrence College um, is bringing us black queer identities, especially gender. And so, I mean, between the two of them who've been working with us since October, they're pulling resources that I just never even would have thought of. So um, it really depends on student work. Thank you so much. Um, Sarah, I think we have another question. Um, this is this comes from Sarah. So would you like to ask? Yeah, sure. sure yeah, I'll ask my own question. Um, yeah, I would love to hear your opinions about um, fashion brands recent statements or lack of statements declaring solidarity with Asian American and Pacific Islander communities uh, in response to the uptick in hate and violence towards Asians uh, during the pandemic. Um, I'm wondering if you think it's important for fashion brands to make these kinds of statements or are they just lip service in your opinion? Honestly, um, I think one unique thing about my placement in the fashion system is as a professor, not only can I teach the industry or bring these classes, but Another part of my job is advising research from students. I'm advising a couple of theses right now. And uh, one of my students in particular is working on all of this. She's been working on a thesis, tracking all of this before um, the racial reckoning happened. And she is getting so much material. She is interviewing participants from the fashion industry, telling their stories from inside of these companies that you know we're thinking of. And she and I talk about it. We just spoke uh, this week. And um, I guess the short answer to your question is that a lot of it is performative and lip service. Um, there, for some of the participants for her thesis, um, th like for instance, there was one company that the participant that my student was interviewing had said all of these things that the company was doing that was very problematic and how they were oppressing different racialized groups within the company. And it was that exact company, which is under a very famous luxury conglomerate that made a proud announcement during the summer of their DNI initiatives. Mm -hmm. So we have evidence here on the inside. And so, um, 
you know, some of these companies don't know that I have this insider perspective. And um, there's already a couple of companies I've spoken with and they don't know that, you know, I have students who are writing papers about their work or have spoken to participants for their, for their brand. Um, so, uh, so yeah, unfortunately, you know, the question is, should it take the death of individuals, these traumatic events for us to move our feet and get upset and for you to make a statement? You know, how many times do we need to keep doing this? So, um, and again, you know, the thing I'm, I'm constantly complaining about is there's no structural change. You know, it's all, um, as, as a, um, a business advisor was telling me recently, it's all lipstick, you know, it's just this thing that they put on and it's part of the programming, it comes out of the marketing budget, um, but is it really changing policy? So, yeah. Thank you so much for that response. Yeah, and actually we have a, a question that um, addresses one of these issues that you just ra raised about um, structural issues as well. Um, this comes from Camille Kulik, who says, um, thank you for your opportunity, for the opportunity to learn about your important and impactful work. Um, furthering your discussion of Gucci and Prada's problematic design decisions, I'm wondering how you account for fashion's enduring racial appropriation issues. Um, furthermore, what do you believe are realistically the best practices to ameliorate these structural issues long term? So one thing I mentioned in the talk is um, one thing, I mean, this isn't by any means going to just transform these companies, but one way of addressing it and kind of calling it out was objects and matter section where we're listing actual designers, like photos of the designers inappropriately wearing something to kind of show, like, you know, we want it to be that thing where, you know, no company really wants to be on the objects that matter example. They don't want to be a case study for everyone to look at of how not to do it. Um, so there's that. Um, and also there's the education work that I'm trying to do, but do these companies, you know, do they really want to have a budget line item for this? Um, I consider it like an insurance policy, um, but uh, many companies just find it oddly, you know, more economical just to, you know, let the fire start and they'll just throw all the money towards fixing it. No changes are made. Um, and they continue on these practices. Um, as my student was saying this week, um, who's working on her thesis addressing these issues, you know, she said, honestly, I don't think that they care. You know, unfortunately for some of these companies, it's just, you know, so to answer your question, many of them, you know, that they'll throw some marketing at it. You'll see something on Instagram or Facebook of what they've done or some sort of campaign where they're throwing these models of color, or, you know, um, to do something for them. Um, but nothing is really changing. And so another response is far more radical, which has been happening for a few years. And in speaking in all the circles um, that I kind of navigate of how people are addressing this, and that is just voting with your dollars. Um, many people just said, I am not, you know, there are numerous options of where else I can buy my jacket or my dress or, you know, I'm just not going to buy your clothing anymore. Um, so in boycotting brands um, that, you know, does something. Um, so, so those are some ways, um, again, like education or, um, you know, calling it out on social media um, or just not engaging with them at all, just not giving them your money. Uh, but the, the, the thing is, I don't think, I'm not sure that's enough because with many, if we're talking about luxury, these luxurious brands, um, when it comes to their investors and their stakeholders, um, those are people who are always going to, they can always count on their money with the investors and the stakeholders. And that is who ultimately at the end of the day, they need to satisfy. They throw the marketing budget money towards the social problems or the things that get people upset but they also know these are people who are not necessarily our customers anyway. So let's just shut them up with this marketing campaign. And, you know, these more conservative investors um, who, you know, want to make sure that the brand is always using this kind of model or this certain, you know, white actress to be the face. Um, they will keep doing that. That is who they listen to at the end of the day and who gives, you know, keeps their pockets lined. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's a rare opportunity, but every now and then you'll have a brand that has all of that privilege and will somehow in their heart um, have that moral imperative to do something right and for the good and not just for the investors or just for the marketing. Um, but we don't find many of those companies who just don't care. You know, there's the Patagonias who say, you know, they know they're powerful. They, they know that pl plenty of people are 
buying their um, their outerwear. And, you know, but they're not out to just satisfy investors. Um, they have moral stances and they won't compromise. So, yeah. Thank you so much for your candor. I feel really privileged that we're getting to hear these, these opinions. Um, we have a, another question. This is from Mary Francis. Um, she, first of all, thanks you uh, so much for sharing um, with us about your experiences and your important work. And she asks if you could speak more about the role that creative practices play in that work. Um, she says she's thinking uh, specifically about the fashion and race, deconstructing ideas, reconstructing identities exhibition. Yeah, um, so I made it into three sections. Now I'm jogging my mind. There was um, a section called, so there were three sections that I broke it up into. And um, I was working in this with the um, Sheila C. Johnson Design Center. The Sheila C. Johnson Design Center takes over almost the first floor, ground level floor of the of Parsons School of Design at 13th Street and Fifth Avenue. And um, so they have a curatorial team. You can come in with the ideas, but they also kind of um, add their opinions and, and kind of guide you. And so it's like an exhibition on training wheels a bit. And so um, I had this concept, which they accepted and that we went with. And so it was having the exhibition broken up into three sections. The first section being deconstructing ideas, reconstructing identities as a concept, as something I wanted to teach the audience or the visitors. So I looked for art pieces from students that were working with kind of this theory of race. And so one oh gosh, I'm trying not to forget names. There was one student um, who the day of the exhibition, you know, she was handing me her art pieces and then moving to Berlin that day. So I'm just like keeping everything in my Brooklyn apartment. She made these large framed pieces of these paper shirts that she made that included statistics and data. She interviewed people, uh, women who were black and European and talking about their experience of never being enough in terms of their racialized experience, not French enough or not British enough because of their blackness. And so um, she made these pieces where um, it's kind of like a map of all the data making this kind of paper shirt. It's kind of hard to describe without showing you. And then she put them in these large frames and then I hung those up on the wall and that was part of the deconstructing section. There was also an art piece by Avery Youngblood, um, How to Be Black. It was a zine she had made um, that was this tongue in cheek kind of booklet of how to be black, like a handbook. And so we had that mounted on the wall and then we also use Joy Douglas's um, recidivism focus piece, Rebranded, which was kind of breaking through these structures and reconstructing an identity. So I was like, you know, just trying to kind of categorize some of these pieces. Then you go, and that was all in the hallway. And then on one wall, you had the fashion film for Rebranded showing so everyone could see it. And it was um, looping as the video looped. Um, Joy had picked uh, Gil Scott Heron's The Revolution Will Not Be uh, Televised. So that's playing and people are just kind of stopping and just thinking, oh my gosh, what is this? And um, she's using these images from like Hillary Clinton from the nineties. And so it, it was really provocative. Go inside the gallery and then there is the racialized body. And so there were students who did fashion. Here's where you get the fashion design pieces. So Car Carrie, um, Carly Haywood had her kind of um, this sort of beast, a wild beastly piece that was speaking to the animalistic body, you know, and just sort of trying to break through these um, notions and dominant narratives of um, blackness and animality. And then you had LaShun Coster's that kind of red dress and the horned piece also talking about this, um, building upon these stereotypes and trying to shatter them. And then there was a dress we put at the very front in the window um, by, oh gosh, I'm forgetting names, my brain. Um, I'm managing so much information in my head. Um, but um, she did a prom dress piece and it was made from um, Angelina print. It was a sort of like a um, African print dress that she made. It was this kind of black and proud prom dress. It was very, it had this kind of couture quality. And then there was a piece by Katusia Gregoire called Hood Dandy that also sat at the front. And, and so people on Fifth Avenue saw it. And that was also speaking to the racialized body that they had this like, it was this high fashion piece. It was a do rag that she made. And um, this knit piece, this very colorful knit piece that played on color palettes from the 1970s and was speaking to this, 
this really funky 1970s aesthetic um, and um, kind of these kind of sagging pants. And it was, so she had this beautiful statement about what the piece says about black dress in the seventies and um, making the do rag chic and stylish and um, just speaking to uh, black masculinity and, and queer identity. So um, it was really, um, um, that, that one was really fabulous. I had um, invited um, Andre Leon Talley, fashion veteran Andre Leon Talley for some programming. We screened his film, um, the, the Gospel According to Andre. So I invited the director of the film and Andre. I didn't think he would actually say yes. And he, he did, he showed up. He said, I'd love to, it'd be an honor. So he comes and, and it was just a crowded wall to wall. Um, we couldn't even fit people in the room. And he just put on a show talking about the film. And I gave him a private tour of the gallery space. And it's like, who did this one? And he really loved the hood dandy one. Um, and, and he looked at that oxblood dress with the horned piece and said, oh, that's giving me McQueen. And, you know, so um, it was really great also just to have that acknowledgement from a fashion figure. Thank oh, you and so then, then, oh, sorry. <laughs> there was the, then the third piece was the photography piece. Um, challenging the gaze. I had, I had a section called sort of like ch challenging the gaze um, in fashion photography. And that's where I showed the students doing work. Miles Lofton's piece was uh, talking about black, uh, black masculinity and black boy joy in the midst of um, police shootings. And it's, so it's all these boys hugging and just laughing, wearing colorful hoodies where, you know, in the past of Trayvon Martin, the hoodie was something that, you know, led to his death. So um, so that, and then uh, Stevens and Asco doing more pieces on uh, queer identity and Rachel Cassandra Givens talking about um, being a black woman and doing these gorgeous self portraits of herself, so. Great, um, thank you so much for sharing um, the works of your students with us and really how they are engaging with um, these really critical social and racial issues that we've been talking about. Um, we actually have one last question um, from Maggie. Um, who thanks uh, you again for your, uh, your, for your lecture um, and asks, would you be able to share examples of other techniques that you've used to incorporate the fashion histories of marginalized communities in your survey oriented courses? Um, with similar issues in art history in mind, um, Maggie is also curious about um, your opinion of Western centric survey courses should these courses be redesigned to address global or more inclusive histories? Yes, so I'll start with the last question first, yes. Um, and again, this wasn't as big of a deal several years ago. And then by 2019 and 2020, we've been seeing this overhaul or departments all over. I mean, this especially came to a head over a year ago with Yale University deciding to take down their survey, their long running Western survey course. And um, instead having these kind of broken up specific uh, classes and, you know, some students love the idea and some students hate it, you know, we're just thinking, you know, I get all, you know, some students were thinking, I get all of my information from these large surveys. And now you're telling me I have to take, you know, like Chinese art history and then Africa, you know, and so they have to do all of that and not get the full story, but then you have to question, well, what is the full story? Is the survey really the full story too, you know? Um, I guess if I could have it my way, I, I think you should have just had the, you could keep the survey for the students who can't really enroll in too many classes um, due to their load and just like diversify it. That's all we, you know, that's just one low hanging fruit. You could have just diversified, greatly diversified the survey. Um, but, you know, I, I'm sure they were, they, they're the experts. I'm sure they, they knew what they were doing with the curriculum there. But, um, so in terms of how I've been working on this, you know, people, colleagues, people in my field are all working furiously right now on diversifying their fashion history classes. Um, and, um, you know, scholars who've been working for years uh, are now having to kind of rethink their syllabus and diversify it in ways that they're not fully comfortable with. Not in a way that, you know, they don't want to, but they just, you know, imagine teaching for 20 years in the same way, the same experts, the same icons, you know, or the same canon we're supposed to focus on. Uh, and now you have to change all of that. Uh, and you cannot rely on just guest speakers to do the work for you. So, um, 
so, so there's that, um, just this huge shift where you're seeing this happen, which I think will necessitate just hiring these, you know, more diverse um, scholars. But, you know, it's very difficult in some of these spaces, especially if you have people who are tenured. How are you going to do that? Um, I can already see complaints happening with, you know, contingent faculty members shouldering the burden, you know, the important work of diversifying, but they're stuck in a part-time lecturing role, while the people who are in a tenured role don't really have to change that much, and every all the radical changes are happening on the backs of contingent laborers, so there's that. Um, so, um, so that, and that has been happening. Um, so I think that schools also need to consider uh, cluster hires, which we're seeing a couple of schools interested in doing, from RISD to I think maybe the new school and Ryerson University, that's how I got hired. Um, and so, um, and also, I, I don't want to say, I don't want to use the words lowering your expectations, but sort of when I was hired at Ryerson University, I did not hold a PhD, but they offered me this tenure track position to see, well, let's see what you can do. You're doing the work. So also just changing the language we're using in these hiring posts that we're giving, you know, you, there could be numerous people who you could be hiring, give them a shot you know, or, you know, a tenure track position where they can bring something and that's valuable if they can kind of greatly diversify um, the way you're teaching art history. I think that's worth something, but we're just so kind of used to just must hold this PhD, must know this, this, and this. And so it, it's also time to revisit that language of the canon and what someone knows because you're already cutting out, disqualifying numerous groups of people and we're not gonna really get anywhere. Um, and so in terms of what I'm actually, so I've been doing myself, in the uh, fashion and race class, I had the privilege of letting it, you know, the new school let it run for about three years. Um, usually uh, with the pitched courses, you just let it run for maybe one or two years, but it was popular enough to where they just said, let, let's just let it keep going. Um, and so that gave me time to experiment I, and find new readings. Um, I was um, bringing a, quite, quite a bit of art history and design history into the syllabus because there just wasn't quite enough happening in my in my corner in fashion studies and fashion history. So um, pieces like from Sarah Chang, who's an advisory board member for the Fashion Race Database. She's over in the UK and I, I greatly admire her. Um, she's done pieces on um, like, for instance, um, to be specific, there's a reading I love assigning every year that she did for, I think it's Design History Journal. And it's about um, Selfridges. It's, it's, she, she examines three different department stores, but how um, in the 19-teens and 1920s, how um, there was this pillaging going on by Europeans in China at the fall of one dynasty and taking all of these pieces over to London to these department stores. And I'm talking footstools, uh, tapestries, you, know, you name it. They're just going in and taking everything, bringing it into these um, department stores. Either it's the real material that they're reselling cleaning up and reselling or they're copying in and using it for something. And so the article is about selling Chineseness and what does authenticity and authentic Chineseness look like? And so you've already pillaged this area, you're reselling their materials. Also, it is sort of reinscribing or reinforcing these narratives about what Chineseness looks like and buy this emperor robe. You know, you see all the catalogs. Um, she examines the catalogs there, the language that they use for these white models that are wearing these emperor robes. And so it also helps to kind of boost white feminine, uh, feminine white supremacy in a way too, by also kind of um, cutting down, you know, th these men who are sort of emperors. And just to say, you know, the white woman's body can kind of carry this and reduce it to a fashion piece. Um, that is sort of like an act of domination in itself. Um, so it's a really fascinating piece. There's so much more to that, you know, but that that's something that I can introduce to students about how at the retail level with the appropriation, the physical appropriation of goods and how it can be scrubbed down, deracialized and then sold and reinscribed with new narratives to sell. Um, I've been a fan ever since undergrad. I've carried this book, Megrophilia by Katrine Archer Straw. And I assign um, a book on... Um, kind of a fetish and African, the fetish of African masks and um, kind of all of these, you know, uh, designs that were popular um, throughout Africa for the Parisian, not just hipster audience, but just these collectors or um, Negrophiles, as they call themselves, these white men who would kind of sit back in their armchair and collect all of these pieces from Africa. And they would kind of decide 
um, what is the right kind of African mask. And that was really an exercise of curating and deciding um, the fang mask is the best kind of African mask because of its shape, you know. So just telling an entire continent and group of people what good design or what, you know, what is the ultimate Africanness, you know. And you would see these fashionable images. I would show, as, we ass as I assigned that reading, I showed like this fashion image that was from Vogue magazine because Vogue is old enough to, for me to use as a whole case study for every bit of my fashion and race issue because all the problematic stuff they posted in the first half of the century. And it's this woman descending a, a staircase and to show how modern and cool and advanced she is, you just see the fang mask hanging. And so there was just something very exotic about that. Um, so, so, I mean, and again, there's so much more to that, but that's, those are ways that I could do that um, we talk about cultural appropriation for an article um, on Carmen Miranda, and we would look at Carmen Miranda and, you know, just her whole design, her, her dress practice and her performance. So, I mean, these are things that are swinging outside of fashion studies or fashion history, but they became very useful. And, and then there was just like one more piece in terms of history, like, you know, how are you doing this? Um, that I would do, uh, it was, uh, oh gosh, it was a piece. I think it was from the book Chinese Looks and because I would also talk about um, um, Asian racism, anti-Asian racism back then in the class and um, the Exclusion Act and just the struggle for citizenship and belonging through dress. And so there's this book Chinese Looks and there was this uh, article I used by Sean Metzger and it talks about Susie Wong and um, the stage play um, based off of the book of the world of Susie Wong and then the film and just also how he just kind of unpacks and picks apart the casting of the right kind of Susie Wong who was um, one of the popular ones was biracial so it was something like we want her Asian but not too Asian you know but then we also want her to have this kind of broken English you know we want her to sound you know like she's struggling through the words I mean there's just so much there and then just looking at all the images and how the Chiang Sam dress becomes popular and becomes even more sexualized with this high slit made possible through the two actresses who portrayed Susie Wong and how they're splashed over Life magazine and everywhere and really kind of sexualized as this like little sex kitten just kind of curled up on us on a bed and she doesn't know any better and um, she has to be kind of saved by this white man um, and, and, and so it, there's a lot there but you know so these are some of the things in terms of creating your own fashion history frameworks. You know, these are things that we didn't necessarily assign in fashion history classes, but in me kind of finding these pieces through design history or, you know, other departments, um, kind of constructing something for ways for us to think through these things. Oh, and there's one assignment that we did in fashion and race also, where I called it um, sort of decentralizing fashion history. And so I challenged the students um, by the mid semester, who would you, if we were to build a whole new canon, who would you like to see? And so that was an opportunity. You could do this in art also, you know, for art history. Who do you want to see? Who should be there? Who, who do you want to induct into the canon? So the students would write a piece and they would walk up to the front of the room behind the podium. And then they, you know, we had this large screen and they would kind of announce, you know, this is who I'd like to bring in. And this is why they need to be um, included in fashion history books. So. That's an hey. awesome idea. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Jenkins. Uh, that's a wonderful way to end the evening. Um, I think you were demonstrating to us what a marvelous teacher you are. I think we all would like to take your courses. Uh, we've learned so much from you this evening. Uh, so many wonderful uh, ideas and, and uh, initiatives and innovations that, that you have undertaken and, and introduced us to this evening. And I'm sure that we're all going to enjoy exploring uh, the database that, that you and your team have, have built. And, and it's so exciting that it's grown and has the support of the institution behind it. Um, that, that's really, I think, a hopeful, uh, a hopeful sign for, for continued um, improvement in, in all of the uh, problems that, that you and, and others are, are helping us to think through and to uh, reckon with. And I think that your engagement with the fashion industry is also um, you know, such an important uh, uh, project. And, and, and I hope that that, that that interest that you said has plateaued. I hope that that isn't a permanent plateau. We hope that that's going to continue to evolve and grow. So um, it, thank you. I yeah, it was really a privilege for us to have you with us on, on, on online this evening as, as we've all been operating um, for a year now. 
Um, and, and we look forward to uh, you know, keeping up with you and, 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 and all of your projects. So thank you again um, for being with us in the, the fourth of, of our lectures. The, the final one will be on April 27th with Carrie Watson. So you're all invited to come back for that. Um, but until then, thank you again, Professor Jenkins and, and good evening to our audience. Thank you. Thank you everyone for 